people may want teams to stop tanking, but it's a hard thing to enforce when it kind of sort of works. Maybe there's a way we can come up with incentives to not tank, or maybe there's a big overhaul that I'm suggesting baseball might consider. Anyway, let's talk about baseball. It's Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB. Thank you for making Locked On MLB your first listeners. We're available on all your free podcasting platforms. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. And yes, we're doing it through the offseason as well. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. Today's episode is being dropped late on the 11th day of November 2021. So you may be catching this on the 12th. I'm not going to tell you how to listen, but I am going to tell you we're going to be talking about why some teams tank because it works. One team that tanked is about to reap the benefits soon. I'm going to play a clip from Stacy Gotsoulias' podcast where she makes some really, really good points about starting times of the World Series. And I make a radical suggestion for something that may prevent tanking later on in baseball life, provided we have a season with an upcoming lockout. Now, hey, we are available wherever you get your podcasts. We're also here on YouTube, and you can follow us on Twitter at Lockdown MLB Pod. Same handle on Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. So I want to just bring up one thing. First of all, there are free agents that are out there. There's a looming lockout that may be coming in a couple of weeks. The fact that the Mets don't have anybody running the show right now is um, kind of sort of insane. It's going to be a focus point of a podcast that I'm going to be doing next week. Um, I just think that that the Mets situation deserves a whole entire podcast to itself. But one team that actually didn't finish the season with a record uh, that was that different for the New York Mets was surprisingly the Detroit Tigers. Now, the Tigers had a brand-new manager, a disgraced manager, A.J. Hinch. I can just hear Stacey Gatsulia scream that A.J. Hinch is a disgraced manager and Alex Cora is a celebrated manager. Uh, there is a disconnect in terms of why the Cora is – his involvement in the Astros scandal has been kind of swept away and Hinch still wears it. But the Tigers finished the season 77 and 85. So did the New York Mets. Now, the Mets were in first place up until August, and then they wound up losing the division to the eventual World Series champion, Atlanta Braves. Therefore, their 77 and 85 record felt a little different than the Detroit Tigers 77 85 record because the Tigers, who were considered to be doormats, considered to be an easy win, suddenly became a competitive team this year. They didn't have a winning record, but they weren't pushovers. In the truncated season of 2020, they had a winning percentage of 397. That was Ron Gardenhire's last year. And he left, and Lloyd McClendon finished the season out. And the Tigers, certainly after the death of Mike Illich and the team didn't want to seem to spend any money, fell on some pretty hard times. But they turned things around a little bit, and a couple of pieces could turn them into contenders. They have the, the Tigers have very good pitching. They have a lot of good young pitching. They have a couple of decent bats, but you get the sense that if you have a veteran starting pitcher in the rotation to sort of anchor the squad. And then you could maybe insert a veteran player, kind of like when Padre Rodriguez joined the Tigers after the 2003 playoffs and World Series. Tigers were historically bad then, but then they eventually turned it around and got to the World Series. And Padre Rodriguez was a big reason for that turnaround. Now, and, and the, his, the culture of the Tigers came where they made to the World Series in 06. And throughout the 
you know, the first half of the 2010s, the Tigers contended virtually every single year, probably because Illich decided to spend money hoping to win a championship before he died. It didn't happen. He did get to a couple of World Series along the way. And he put together a tremendous pitching staff filled with a bunch of guys who eventually went on to win Cy Young Awards. Now Scherzer and Verlander won Cy Young Awards with the Tigers, and um, Parcello would go on to win a Cy Young Award with Boston. And there was even a cameo from David Price, who had won a Cy Young Award with the uh, Tampa Bay Rays. The one thing that they'd never acquired, and David Dombrowski never seemed to acquire, was the depth in their bullpen. And their bullpen caused a bunch of heartbreaking losses. The Tigers probably should have won the World Series in 2013. They had the best team in the American League, but that was the big poppy Grand Slam and eventually the Victorino Grand Slam. Those were two losses of games started by Max Scherzer that the bullpen blew for the Detroit Tigers. Well, the Tigers got, after the death of Village and they broke the team up, they got historically bad going 47 and 114. They didn't even win 50 games in 2019. But then Hinch comes in and Candelario is a good player. They have some decent pitching. And you can't help but think, and this is not exactly uh, shocking thinking on my part, there's the idea that maybe Correa could have a reuni uh, reunion with Hinch. Correa played under Hinch in when the Astros won the World Series in 2017. They did. You can look it up. Whatever you think about that World Series is up for debate, but they did win and they were a combination. And I think that you're probably going to see, oh yeah, the, the Astros are going to get booed all the time. And Astros fans just get used to it until all the Astros from 2017 are gone. It's, it's going to happen. And Correa was one of the big faces of that 2017 team. Now, I, I think it'd be absolutely insane if the Astros let Carlos Correa walk. They have the money. Every team has the money. There's not one single cash-strapped team in baseball. No, not the A's. They have a billionaire owner. So do the Rays. Those people are swimming in money. They choose not to spend it, okay? There is no such thing as a cash-strapped Major League franchise. And the Astros can, right now, before I'm finishing this sentence, can sign Carlos Correa to a long-term deal and just end this nonsense. But they haven't yet. And reuniting with A.J. Hinch could be a big boom for the Tigers. And guess what? Two other players from those great Tiger teams from, well, Justin Verlander is going to be available. And he was a member of those great Tiger team. And he also played on that Astros team with Hinch and with Correa. And Max Scherzer was a big part of that, and he's a free agent. Um, now, I don't know if there's any bad blood between Scherzer, who's a member of the Nationals, who wound up winning that World Series against Houston in 2019. I don't know how bad blood works, and neither do you. But that being said, could there be a getting the band back together in terms of the Astros stars, Verlander and Correa, and Verlander and Scherzer from those glory years of the Detroit Tigers with Miguel Cabrera still hanging around, it would kind of feel a little bit like when the Giants turned some things around this last year and they still had a bunch of familiar faces, including Belt, Crawford, and Posey. It's possible. Also, you consider that the American League Central is a winnable division. Now, the Indians have fantastic pitching. They can't hit. And the Twins had a bad year last year, but they're just a couple of years removed from a hundred win season. And a lot of the same talent is still there. You know, team won the division in 2019 and in the truncated 2020 season, they had a down year. Could they come back? I think they probably could. I don't think they're as bad as the team as they were. They'll probably get a decent draft pick for their troubles. I'll get to that in a minute. The Chicago White Sox won the division this last year. They were a playoff team in the, in the COVID season, and they're probably going to be the favorite team to win the division again, but they're hardly a juggernaut. And if the Tigers continue to improve, then you can look up and say, hey, look it. 
this is a squad that had some success, then had some really bad failures, and then they built the team back up, and here we are. Here we are. And they are a couple of major league stars away from being a true contender and playing in the, you know, in a very winnable division. The, you know, the Tigers have money. Every team has money. They don't have gigantic uh, commitments with the exception of Miguel Cabrera. And you know what? This could be, this really could be a year where the Tigers turn things around and show pretty much what they can do and turn themselves into a team that fell on hard times and turned it around. And I think that some people are ready to move on from the booing of the Astros. I was getting that before. Astros fans, you know people are going to boo your team from this point forward. But I think a lot of the venom is going to be gone after this year. I really do. I think there'll be some booing. Yeah, they're a bunch of cheaters, but it won't be with the vitriol that they had this year. I think part of that was people ready to boo them all through 2020, and then COVID hit. And so it was pent up anger and seeing them get to the league championship series in the wake of all that and seeing them continue to have success, I think sparked it. And I think it'd be good for the Astros to continue to spark that hate because, you know, bad guys are good. It's a good thing to have bad guys in sports. People like to root against teams, but the Tigers whose fan base went through had some great, great moments in the last decade, but couldn't win at all. And of course, the Tigers have been sitting there and they haven't won the World Series since 1984. And you just get the sense that city would just explode and embrace a World Series champion Tiger team. Maybe the redemption of individual members of that Houston Astros team can be elsewhere and win in Detroit. There are worse places to win. So I'd be interesting to see if there's a reunion there. I mean, would that make the Tigers the odds-on favorite to win the American League Central? I don't know, but it would make them a better bet than they've been for a long time. A couple of years ago, they couldn't win 50 games. And now, I think the mid-80s is a pretty safe bet if you want to see where Detroit will go, if they take advantage, spend a little money and say, we're going to add some veterans to this team. That would make them a sure bet. And if you're going to make any bets, go to Bet Online. It remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to the new and updated mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Use promo code LOCKEDON to receive your bonus from basketball, Football, hockey, baseball, UFC, right to your favorite Las Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the offers available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports team. Bet Online is where the game starts. You know, the, the collective bargaining agreement is going to expire in a few weeks, and the there's a looming lockout. Um, I, I was there in 94, 95. I remember how awful all these lockouts and all, believe me, excuse me as I scratch my nose, the the notion of doing a daily baseball podcast while there's a labor situation is uh, not high on my priority list. But then again, I did one when we're in the middle of the pandemic. So, you know, I can adapt. I'd rather not. Uh, I don't think baseball having a lockout in the offseason is necessarily the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world is if it starts to affect the actual season. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to panic if they're locked out for a chunk of the winter. But one of the things that needs to be addressed is the concept of tanking. Now, here's the thing. The concept of rebuilding is smart. If you look at your team and you say, hey, we're not going to contend and we may never contend. But if we trade our veterans and get young players back and may take a couple of years, but then we will have a competitive team. And 
that seems like a smart thing to do. In fact, it's hard to argue against it. If you, one of the worst things you can be as a team is consistently 75 to 80 wins every year. That means you're not really contending. You're not putting a winning product on the field. And you're not so bad that you're going to get a, a high draft pick in the draft, but you're not really contending. So you're really in a neutral zone. So what baseball has done over the last bunch of years is create a situation where if you're not a playoff team, you're better off being that team that couldn't win 50 games that the Detroit Tigers were just a few years ago. You're better off being horrible than mediocre. Now, mediocre is should be better than horrible. You know, horrible is what you want to avoid in life. And yet the system is set up where you'd rather just say, just be awful, just be awful, and then we can rebuild. And as I said, when you look and you see, what did the Astros do when they won the World Series? They banged their trash cans. Fine, fine, fine. But they also built together a hell of a team. And the Astros were terrible, 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 terrible in the early 2010s. And around 2012, they traded away everything that wasn't nailed down. And they stunk. And they picked up some draft picks, including Carlos Correa. And by 2015, they were contenders. And by 2017, they were banging their trash cans all the way to a World Series championship. The Chicago Cubs in the early, 2000, the early to mid 2010s just did fire sale after fire sale after fire sale. By 2015, they were the league championship series. By 2016, Cub fans could die and go to heaven and not wonder if they're ever going to see their team win the World Series. The Atlanta Braves were a playoff team in 2013, blew the team up. They were a 90-some-odd loss team, and then through the players that they acquired in the draft, they had a World Series championship this year. It's hard to say stop tanking when you look up and you see, but it works. But it works. But here's the problem, and I'm going to reference a movie that's not exactly in the new release section. And that's just how old I am because I'm still talking as if people go to a video store and don't just click on Netflix. Think about the movie Cocoon. If you haven't seen the movie Cocoon, it's actually a really good movie. And in that, there's a swimming pool that's in a weird house next to a retirement community in Florida. And a group of old men wander into the area where there's a swimming pool. They see that there's a alien object in it that when they go in the water, they get rejuvenated. They're kind of old and broken down and they get rejuvenated. They suddenly get lots of, uh, you know, lots of vigor. They get sexually charged, emotionally charged, and it makes them feel younger and it sort of rebuilds them. And it was a great thing until the other people in the retirement community figured out what was happening. And then they all ran into the pool and by the time they all jump in the pool, the power of the cocoon was, was sapped. And too many people were jumping in the pool and the rejuvenation no longer worked. Why am I bringing up this movie? First of all, if you haven't seen it, it's a really good movie. And it's, it, it brings a tear to my eye because it was, it's just a good, solid movie. But that's kind of like how the tanking situation, when a few teams were doing it, and say, all right, we're not going to be that good, but we're going to pick up the draft picks. You know, what the, you know, what the Astros is, they just flushed their farm system with as many prospects as possible. And some of them worked, some of them didn't, but it gave their system a ton of depth where if even they had to, if they were in a situation where they want to trade young players, they just knew there was a ton of players that were just coming through their system now. And it worked. But when the problem that happens is, Anybody who is a mediocre team starts to think, well, why don't we just tank? What's the point of putting together a good product? We're better off just tanking. You know, Baltimore is going to pick up a bunch of draft picks and the Rangers are a hundred lost team and the Diamondbacks are a hundred lost team and the Pirates are a hundred lost team. And, you know, and, and then you start to see the Cubs 
who won the division in 2020 were a playoff team 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, not in 2019, but back in 2020. And they were in first place in June. And they stubbed their toe and they traded away everybody and just tanked. And you saw that they were contenders getting into the summer while the Braves had a losing season and they wound up making a few trades and suddenly found themselves winning a World Series. But you're rewarding tanking. But the thing is, is that it's not as easy as just, well, we're just going to trade away all of our young players or trade away all of our veterans, bring in young talent and, and make draft picks. But you have to trade for the right players. You have to make the right draft picks. You know, year in and year out, the Pirates were one of the worst teams in baseball. They kept picking number one, number one. They, they whiffed on a bunch. You saw teams, just because you have a high pick doesn't mean you're going to make a good one. Just because you trade away a veteran for young players doesn't mean those young players are going to pan out. And teams are getting smarter now. They're not going to trade away three or four top prospects for your veteran because they're hoarding their young players too. And one of the things that happens is you start seeing if you're not a superstar, but you're just a good, solid major leaguer, then you're going to get shut out at free agency when the team says we're better off having a bunch of minor leaguers on the team and losing 110 games than having some you know, major leaguers on the team and losing 85. And I, you know, I would love to see a team. And the Royals tried this. It didn't work. But I admired the Royals for trying when they picked up Carlos Santana and a couple other players to basically say, hey, well, why don't we just sign some of these players that nobody wants? And I admired it. It didn't work. But I admired that they actually said, let's try to put a decent product on the field. Because lest we forget, one of the reasons why I keep track of the summer score and I keep track of when people are when teams are um, actually in a position for a playoff spot throughout the you know throughout the year after Memorial Day. Is baseball isn't a public utility, isn't a financial corporation. It's entertainment for the summer. That's what it is. It's a form of entertainment. And if about roughly half the teams are not trying to put an entertaining, you know, quality product on the field, then how entertaining is that? When you have a mess of teams that by Memorial Day have already said, we're out, we're just, you know, we're just going to hoard draft picks and, and try to get as many young players and not in, and, and of course the other elephant in the room is not pay players, you know, high salaries. Why don't we just, you know, pay league minimum for a bunch of minor leaguers? And so you get a bunch of quality players who can't find a job and a bunch of minor leaguers who probably should be developing in the, in the farm up on the major league level. So one of the issues, and I've, I've listened to a bunch of people talk about what can we do about the draft? You know, if you are going to reward a team for trying to lose 110, 115 games, then you're going to encourage people to put a garbage product on the field. And sometimes what that also does is it inflates win totals. A couple of years ago, you saw a bunch of teams in the American League all winning 100 games. And some of them are like, this Yankee team's not a 100-win team. That Twins team was not a 100-win team. But there were so many teams that were tanking that it just it made the, the win total puff up. I was, there was a, a Don LaGreca said on the Michael K show, why not give the, you know, instead of giving the top pick of the draft to the worst team in baseball, why don't you give it to the team that just misses the playoffs? Like reward teams for trying, reward teams for making an effort. And there's some issues there because then you're like, well, the last week of the season, well, should we be a wild card team or should we try to get the number one pick in the draft? And there's always ways people can work around to tank. But I understand what they're saying is like, why give a team that's 
putting a bad product on the field a reward. Now, the, that number one pick in the draft, you could say, well, you know, do a lottery system like they have in the NBA. But, you know, I, there's an elephant in the room here, which is the number one pick in the draft is not always the best player. And I'm not talking about situations like where Mike Trout was drafted, like in the teens or in the 20s, and people just passed over him until it was available, where the Angels actually used their second pick to draft Mike Trout, the best player of this generation, was available to like 15, 16 teams, could have picked him if they wanted, and they didn't. But the elephant in the room is with the way they've set up the draft now with slots, money slots, and everything like that, you can only pay X amount for a, a, you only get a certain pool to sign players in the draft. So the number one, if you spend way too much money than the number one pick, you won't have as much money to spend on your second, third, fourth, and fifth round picks. And so you see a lot of times a team have the number one pick in the draft, but not necessarily draft the most talented player, but instead draft the player that they feel like they can afford to sign. And you also know that sometimes the number one pick in the draft is not going to be, uh, may not pan out. But there's still that hope that if you have the worst record, you'll get that first pick, which makes me say, there is the elephant in the room of the draft is similar to how I feel about salary arbitration. When salary arbitration was founded in the 70s, it was pre-free agency, and it made sense for right then. But after free agency was formed, uh, salary arbitration was somewhat antiquated, and it set salary prices based upon the highest bid as opposed to the player's actual value. I think maybe salary arbitration is something that should be in the past. And maybe the MLB draft should be too. What I'm suggesting is, what if we get rid of the draft? Seriously. I mean, it's not, we have the number one pick, therefore you're going to sign the best player available. We've already shown that's not the case. You're drafting based upon what you can afford to do. But you're rewarding a team with the opportunity to draft the best player based upon sometimes incompetency. And then do we really want to see high quality players, great talent going to an organization that isn't trying to win? Now look it, there will always be a call. The, the, the idea of the draft was founded in the 1960s, pre-free agency. We're still in the middle of what was called the reserve clause, which was players could just renew, uh, would have their contracts renewed by the team in perpetuity. And so there wasn't the skyrocketing salaries at the time, but there was a sense of the good teams could just go out and sign the best amateur talent. And there was a sense of equity that was created in the draft. But what if we got rid of it? What if they got rid of the draft? Would that mean that the Dodgers and Yankees would just sign every terrific player available? Maybe, but they also have all the money in the world now, and they don't always sign the right players as it is. And also the international market, whether you're going, you know, the Dominican or Venezuela, all these places where there's wonderful talent, that's always to the highest bidder anyway. And you see that players fall down the, the draft based upon their signability, not based upon where they fit in with the team. And if you eliminate the idea of the worse you are, the better pick you are, maybe that would give an incentive to try to put a somewhat entertaining product on the field and be attractive to some of these players. Like you have to recruit them and say, hey, this is the organization. You will have a clear shot to the major leagues. You will have a better chance 
of being a major leaguer if you sign with the Pirates or you sign with the Rangers. And maybe you want to see the teams that are going into the playoffs have some of the best quality players instead of seeing them signed or drafted by a team and see them flounder there for about four or five years before they inevitably get traded to the Dodgers, Cardinals, or Mets. No team is losing money. There is no cash-strapped teams. And maybe if you eliminate the Major League Draft, you'd be in a situation where scouting departments and analytic departments can put together teams and do so in a way like, well, we better create a quality product on the field. We better be competitive. We better not look like Loserville. Or if we are Loserville, we're showing that we're putting it together and trying to make it a better product. You know, there's no tanking in like entertainment. It's like we're going to make a couple of bad Star Wars films, but we'll be able to draft a couple of good Star Wars characters and make the next film better. Okay. And maybe, just maybe, putting together the chance to make a quality product entertaining, butts in the seats, excitement, because remember, this is entertainment. This is summer entertainment. Might become attractive. Make an effort to make it appealing to play for the Texas Rangers or the Baltimore Orioles or the Pittsburgh Pirates or the Cleveland Guardians, I had to remember, or the Oakland A's, the cash-strapped A's. There are no cash-strapped teams. Billionaire owners are there. Put together an entertaining product. And if you don't want to own that entertaining product, sell it to someone who does. Again, it didn't work with the Kansas City Royals this year, but I admired that they said, hey, what if we put a decent product on the field? It didn't work, but they tried. And I want to reward trying, not not trying. And you can point to the times that it worked, like the Astros, like the Cubs, like the Braves. Sure. What about all the times it hasn't? Maybe we remember those tanking times. Say that three times fast because it's so rare when it works. And we're going to see the A's, we're going to see the Reds put two sticks of dynamite on their teams, which as recently as this year were contending and had playoff spots into the summer, into the late summer. In August, you saw the Reds as a playoff team. You saw the A's right there. They should be talking about making this an exciting uh, uh team going into 2022 instead of, well, we're going to tank. And you know the A's are going to tank because Bob Melvin, who loves, who's from the Bay Area and is beloved in the Bay Area, took one look around and said, oh, I'm going to get out of here. Bye. You're going to see if teams are able benefit from tanking and pulling the whole Bialy stock and bloom from the producers, then what's going to stop them? Now, of course, like the swimming pool and cocoon, once everyone's trying it, the magic isn't always there. One of the best podcasts, I think period, I listen to all the time is one of my fellow Locked On podcasters, Stacey Gatsoulias, who uh, is actually the one who brought me into Locked On. And, and I love her show. And uh, it, she does Locked On Yankees. And, um, and she's, she's fantastic. And, but she doesn't just do great analysis of the Yankees. And we also have very similar uh, tastes of pop culture and pop culture references. I bet she'll get the cocoon references. But she made a couple of really, really terrific points on an episode of Locked on Yankees from uh, last week. And I wanted to bring them on just sort of to play the clip of what she was talking about in terms of World Series start times. This was an episode that originally aired on November 2nd, 
2021. It was about the World Series between the Astros and the Braves. And a lot of people were complaining about the start times and going so late and kids not being able to see it and da 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 And Stacy articulated a couple of things and made a few points about start times and about that complaint about baseball uh, World Series games starting too late. Now, I have to say in full disclosure, I am in California. I have been living in the West Coast uh, since 2005, and I had lived in the West Coast and California during my high school years as well. And uh, the game started five o'clock in the afternoon, which is great. It's great. The games are, you know, the World Series games, you know, go to about nine o'clock, which is kind of late when you consider the game started at five, but it's still a reasonable time. You can get to the end, record a lockdown and they'll be and go to bed. But this is a part of Stacey Gatsoulias' podcast, Locked On Yankees, from the second day of November of this year, where she talked a little bit about starting times and length of game. I think she made a couple of really terrific points. I find it interesting that there are people in my age range complaining about how late games are. When games started at 8.30 when we were kids, we barely got to watch playoff games because (laughs) they literally started at 8.30. Now, the big difference is, and I posted this on Twitter earlier, game one of the 1981 World Series between the Yankees and the Dodgers started at 8.30 Eastern in Yankee Stadium, but it was only two hours and 32 minutes long. So it ended right about 11 o'clock. The next night, same thing. 8.30 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 2.29 was the run time of that game. That's not like that now. We're seeing nine inning, and both games were nine innings. Another fun fact about game one, the Dodger starter only lasted two and two-third innings. They had five pitchers in the game, and the game was still only two, two and a half hours. What's the difference now? Pace of play? Yes. Commercial breaks being longer? Probably. Pitchers taking too long between pitches? Yes. (laughs) Some of these guys take way too long. It's like watching Josh Beckett all over again. Just pitch the ball. I know you need to set and do stuff, and especially if guys are on base, but there are some times where these guys are taking 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 seconds between pitches. It's too long. You shouldn't have nine inning games lasting four hours. It's ridiculous. So anyway, I understand the complaint that the games are too long, but the starting time complaint just doesn't make sense to me. Games always started late. It's just the length that's the problem. And just the way the games are being played. Oh God, I'm going to sound like, I'm going to sound like John Smaltz right now. Oh, it's not, the games aren't the same as they were 20 years ago, but they really aren't. You know, it's, it's a rare thing to see a starter last more than five innings in the postseason this year. But that could be 2020 carryover. So let's wait until next season to see if this trend continues. Hopefully there is a next season. Hopefully everything will start on time. Hopefully there's not a work stoppage. But if this trend of starters not lasting, teams going to their bullpens more and doing bullpen games more continues in 2022, then there might be a problem. But I really feel like this is 2020 carryover and that could be why this postseason is the way it is so i just found that interesting that i don't know it's almost as if people my age forget although to be fair we were kids in the 80s 1981 was 40 years ago so you know your memories get muddy they get confused you confuse things you think that you remember something exactly how it was and it's maybe half the way it was that you remember and then you realize oh wait no it was something totally different so Thank you, Stace Scotts. Got to have you on the show pretty soon uh, again. And uh, check her out at Locked On Yankees. Now, as for us, you can follow us on Twitter at Locked On MLB Pods. Same handle for Instagram. I want to thank you for making Locked On MLB your first listen as we're available on all your podcasting platforms. But hey, what about your second listen? Let me tell you what your second listen should be. It should be Locked On Bets. It's your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked on Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. 
Well, talk about tanking, suggesting that maybe it's time to abolish the draft and wondering if a band is going to get back together and the Astros of 2017 can find redemption by giving joy to the fans of Detroit. This has been Locked On MLB for the 11th day of November, 2021. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sullivan.